Thank you, Franz. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so I'm Franz. Uh, this is indeed me windsurfing. This was uh, a little over a year ago. I'm more confident in it now. So, <laughs> surfer has improved and this has improved. So, I'm talking about Waveform Viewer. And as GTK Wave showed us, a good Waveform Viewer needs an over the top splash screen. So, that's why I made this. Um, let's get into what this thing can do. And I need to zoom in because this will be. Okay, so to a Waveform Viewer, we can add some waves and we can zoom in on things. And this is kind of the standard thing we have with the Waveform Viewer. Uh, we have some data, uh, we have Boolean signals, we have integers, but there's a lot more information here that we would like to be able to see um, more easily than we can right now. So for example, we have a bunch of clock edges here. We should highlight those clock edges because they're kind of significant to the design. So we can do that. And now we can easily see that this stall signal is active for three cycles, for example. Um, we have RISC-V instructions over here. And when you're debugging, you don't want to have to constantly, in your head, do RISC-V disassembly. So let's let the Waveform Viewer do this disassembly for us. We now see that this was a NOP, a load up or immediate, and a bunch of stuff. Uh, we can use colors in nice ways here as well. So if we zoom out, we can see all the points where this was NOP because it's all gray. So now we immediately get a sense of how, uh, how often our processor is stalling. Um, I guess we could have seen the stop signal as well, but this gives us another confirmation that um, that, that is happening. Um, and there's a lot more things like this, but before I talk about m more about Safra, I want to talk about why I built this project. So I'm developing a new HDL called Spade, and when you build a new HDL, especially one that is sort of focused around a lot of types, you have a lot more information in your language than you would in Verilog. Um, but in the compilation process where you go from your HDL to Verilog or VHDL to a simulator to a waveform viewer, you essentially lose information in each of these steps. So the rich type information you had in the HDL is erased in Verilog, and then you're back to reading sort of bit strings, and you have no idea what they meant because you don't know how the compiler decided to pack your struct. So my original goal with Surfer was to link it like this, make the HDL talk to the waveform viewer directly, and then we get all this rich type information. And as an example of what this can do, uh, here is our two signals from my HDL. The first one has a type called option, which is sum or none, and this is essentially a valid, invalid signal. So when the signal isn't valid, you don't have a valid value there. When it's valid, the value is there. And if we translate it using the, the spade translator, we immediately see the, when the signal is valid, when it's not valid. We can zoom in and we can see the sort of spade representation of the signal as well. So we immediately see that, okay, this is sum and it ha the internal value of it is 8000 something. And you could do recursive translation here. So if you had a valid, invalid risk five instruction, you could uh, have that inside there as well. Um, the second signal is a struct. Uh, it has, uh, you can't see all of that. Well, okay, so the, the, it's a struct and then it has three fields, access with address and command. Um, and again, like I wrote the compiler and I wrote the project, but I have no idea how to translate all of these zeros back into the struct representation. So I can let the surfer do that. Uh, I can also expand each individual field since this is a struct. So now I see that the, uh, oh, <laughs> the address is not showing up. I'm not used to this being zoomed in. So it, the first field is always full. So that's sort of the access width. The second field is the command, so we're not doing anything with this memory interface, and then the middle one is the address that we're reading from, which we're not actually reading. But maybe this would be a nice indication that we should investigate why the address is changing when the bus isn't being used. Um, so I should have said that at the start, this is kind of a collaborative project between me, my advisor Oscar, and uh, uh, Lucas Flemmer at uh, Johannes Kepler University. Lucas uses Emacs and I use Vim, so the collaboration is very tense. But we can at least agree that the keyboard, sorry, what? the keyboard is the best way to modify things. So we have a command line interface that you can do very, you can do fuzzy matching. So var add alu cand. It will figure out that you probably did want to variable add alu candidates from the CPU test harness something. And you can uh, do more things. You can add more variables. You can expand signals. Um, and then Oscar, my advisor, he does not like using the keyboard, so he put all these nice menu buttons in the toolbar here so he, uh, everyone can use them for the way they want. At this point, I wanna pull back the curtain a bit and show that this, is, this presentation is inside Surfer, so I can interact here, I can move around, I can use mouse gestures to, to zoom, which is 
Even I, as a keyboard user, have to admit that this is a nice way to interact with the waveform viewer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so this was all done inside Surfer. The problem with that is it took me five days to make five minutes worth of presentation. So um, for the rest, I will open my normal PDF. Uh, and do this. What? Oh, there we go. OK. All right. Um, so kind of in the spirit of what Stefan was talking about in the first presentation after lunch, um, we should be doing more collaboration in open source and not have these single islands of, of things. And then this was also a discussion at OSDA when I started this project, and then I immediately went off and made my own thing. Uh, so <laughs> I wanted to avoid that in the future and make sure that I at least build this so it's extensible so other people can do what they wanted. Because I didn't want to write away from viewer, I wanted away from viewer for my language. So extensibility is a key thing here. Um, the translator system that I use for Spade is fairly generic. Uh, you need to implement three different functions to the final translator, and then you, once you implement those, you can use it. Um, so first of all, you need to define a variable info function. This takes a variable, and, and the translator can say that, oh, this is a struct with four fields, and the first, first field is a substruct or something like that. Second function translates it, takes a bit vector and translates it into a human readable representation or the struct representation, um, which is essentially how you say, how you do the actual translation. And then you can give a third function that is saying, am I able to translate this or not? So the risk five translator, for example, doesn't make a lot of sense to run on a, uh, on a variable that is 17 bits long. It needs to be 32 bits, otherwise it's not going to be valid risk for instructions. So a translator can essentially opt out of translating signals that it doesn't really, that it wouldn't know how to translate anyway. And that reduces the amount of signals you have to view in the list. Um, we are extensible over the waveform formats. So we support v VCD, FST, and GHW. Um, we can support loading formats interactively via TCP. Uh, and we also recently started supporting something called TLM transaction streams, which are a completely different things. It's not actually waveforms. Uh, it's in instead of being signals varying over time, it's transactions that occur at specific time points. Um, but the viewer is extensible enough that we can support both normal waveforms and these transaction things, which I'm quite pleased with. Um, the so the presentation thing I did was me writing JavaScript that controls Surfer to do all the movements and stuff like that. And that you can also do that on, on the desktop version via uh, TCP or WebSocket. So if you have an application where you want to move the view to a specific point, highlight something, add some drawings, things like that, that's possible. Um, this thing runs pretty much everywhere. Uh, we have Linux, Mac, and Windows binaries, uh, I guess, of course. Um, Linux is a bit difficult because glibc is different on some versions, so we have to make a specific Red Hat version. But in general, you can compile it on all these platforms, and usually our pre-built binaries will run. If the pre-built binaries don't run, you can also run WebAssembly. Um, and this has quite a few advantages. So first of all, no installation. I can go to my web browser. I can go to app.surferproject.org. I hope the network is fast enough, because this is a annoyingly big page. Uh, yes. So that's how easy it is to try it. If you had a VCD file, you could drag it in here, or you can click here to use the sort of Pico RV example waveform we use. Where did that? Yeah, there we go. And then you can add waves, um, which I've had several people say is really nice, because GTK wave is hard to compile on a Mac. And they had to do a lecture or something like that. And then it was really nice to have this as a backup plan. Um, WebAssembly also allows us to do uh, inspection of signals inside continuous integration. So if your tests fail, you don't have to download a zip file and, and open that up. So Oscar recently did an, an integration with VUnit, which looks like this. Here it says we have two test branches. We can click the surfer button here. That opens up the waveform from that failing test. Ignore all the VHDL stuff here. We will get rid of that at some point. Um, but now you can inspect the signals here without having to download anything. Uh, and it's embeddable. So this is a teaching tool uh, that uh, they are developing at Johannes Kepler University. 
where students can kind of click around in, in a processor and see how signals change over time. And as part of that, we have this waveform view where if you click an instruction over here, it will bring up Surfer showing that this is what the processor looked like at that point in the simulation. Um, we can also embed it inside VS Code. So there's a VS Code plugin if you don't want to change Windows over to your waveform viewer. It's kind of out of, out of date at, so at this point. We need to update it, but we're not able to update it at the moment. Uh, so if you do use that, it's a few months old, missing some features. Hopefully that will change soon. And we don't actually support this yet, but we do want to support this because uh, Lucas is working with is doing a, a language called Val, which allows you to write scripts that sort of analyze waveforms. So with this, you could write a script that highlights every point where, for example, the ready and valid signals are high, or that translates from buses into transactions on the buses, things like that. Uh, so I want to give some brief technical details. This thing is written in Rust, which I am very pleased with. Um, this gave us nearly free WebAssembly support. So going from zero to being able to have app.surferproject.org online took maybe two or three hours. It does very easy dependency management. So this is all the dependencies we have directly. Transitively, we have about 500 of them. This is what Edelize will do to hardware. And it has supply chain issues and so on, but I wouldn't have been able to build this project in, um, in a little over a year without being able to rely on dependencies this much. Uh, one of the key dependencies we have is the backend for the waveform loading. So loading FST and VCD and, and all of that. Oh, originally, we used a library called Fast Wave Backend by Joshua Emanuel, uh, which worked really well, but it only supported VCD. So we got a message from someone called Kevin Laufer, who is now at Cornell. He was at Berkeley at the time. Uh, and he said, hey, I want to write a FST library in Rust. Would you use it? And of course, we said yes. And I'm very glad we did, because this library does some really cool stuff. It loads FST and GHW in addition to VCD. It does the loading of things in a multi-threaded manner. So compared to the previous library, we went from two minutes to load an eight gigabyte VCD file to only six seconds. Uh, it compresses signals internally until they are read. So uh, you use way less memory than you would if you just had the whole VCD file in memory all the time. Um, and then it's decompressed on demand. This also allowed us to build a project called Server, which is super hard to pronounce at Google, but it's a fun pun, so we're keeping that name. Um, and this allows you to, on your big computation server where you run simulation, you can start server. Uh, that will load up the VCD file, compress it internally, and then it will tell you how to connect to it with Surfer on your desktop. And then Surfer on your desktop will ask to decomp decompress the specific signals you're interested in. So now you don't have to download giant VCD files from your server uh, just to look at a few signals. So this is... My, almost my final slide, there's been a lot of contributions at this point, which I'm super pleased with. When I gave this presentation half a year ago, this list was about half as long. So next time I will not be able to fit everyone in a single slide. Uh, so thanks to all of these people. Uh, and thanks to everyone who's used it and provided feedback, because I'm guessing there's people who have done that here. In conclusion then, Surfer is a snappy and extensible waveform viewer that runs pretty much everywhere. Uh, we now have a waveform viewer that is extensible, so if you have something cool you want to do with waveforms, um, Maybe this is a chance. I think I'll write a Surfer bubble up there if someone wants to discuss doing Surfer stuff on Sunday. Uh, and with that, here's a link to the presentation and you can try it on your phone if you want. So, thank you. Nice one, friends. Um, yeah. Oh. oh, sure. Simon. Oh, hi, great talk, thanks. Uh, any plans to be able to read, say, analog waveform data into the tool? Uh, yes. We, um, yeah, it, it's planned. We don't have the rendering there. Uh, I think we have someone working on that at JKU now, a student. Um, otherwise, I would say I was going to do it, but I'm kind of busy. So, uh, But analog is planned and is coming sooner but or later. But you said reading, right? You're not planning analog read, waveform reading. Ah. Uh, Fair, yeah. Is, is there a specific, do you mean loading analog signals from a VCD file or some so, some other format for? Uh, some other format. Okay. Um, less planned, but very doable. So I we've had other people ask for that as well. So if there's, 
if you have a specific format, maybe open an issue and say we would like this and then we can coordinate what format makes sense. Cool, yeah, so th thank, first of all, thanks for the talk and thanks for the tool. I'm sure a large part of this room have been thinking, I'd really love to write a great waveform viewer. I'm glad someone's actually gone on and, and done it. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, so you, you initially created this as to, to have a good waveform viewer for your HDL. Yep. Going forward, to what extent is this specifically for Spade versus how much like you know first class support you're putting into things like system Velog and VHDL? Uh, so it, it was originally written for, for Spade. I am more inclined to add Spade features, of course, but I've added the features I want, so I'm not actually doing much development here. Oscar is doing a lot more. Um, but, and it's also, the spade thing is only the translator, and the translator system is generic, so someone added support for chisel in the same way. Uh, it's in a fork currently, but there is chisel support. Um, we, are, we have some VHDL support uh, that could absolutely be more fleshed out, um, but it's certainly not limited to spade at all. Right, yes, thank you so much. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is, is there's a mode in Emacs for that. <laughs> Um, the other thing also, I, I'd like to compliment you to the fact that you've actually put something together for a Mac. I mean, I do my design work on a Mac, uh, and that's very much appreciated. And the fact that you're doing GHW, so I use uh, so stuff. So, uh, more of a case of thank you, and I look forward to your VHDL intentions. Yeah, cool, thank you. So, friends, when, when we met in Latchup earlier this year, I was a little bit angry, because I'm kind of over people reinventing the wheel, kind of halfway. Um, however, I reckon I've changed my tune now. So. Um, I mean, we were discussing, I'm like, why didn't you just fix GTK Wave? And the answer was, well, it sounds like GTK Wave, the code base is like, not great. Quite old, hasn't been updated, and I don't know, maybe every now and again it's time to throw the baby out with the bathwater and rewrite everything in Rust. Um, and I suppose on that basis, this, like, going forward, uh, you know, are we intending for this to sort of ultimately be a replacement for GTK Wave to... Um, yeah, yeah. That feels like the way it's going from my perspective. Uh, I, yeah, I, I wanted to build a better way from your, for myself originally, and then it turns out that a lot more people than I expected want a better way from your. And I would, I was legitimately trying to use GTK way for my use case, and it was just, it was too much effort. This was easier process, unfortunately. Yeah, no, I think there's a lot of great features here, and I'd love to see it succeed, you know. Yeah, I just want to comment. No, no question is that we have a chip flow, we are doing our own stuff, but we also looked at TDK Wave and we said, yeah, it's not possible for us. And we are looking at server and we think that we can do it with server and that we can cooperate on server to get it to the ultimate waveform viewer. Yeah. Cool. Great to hear. Um, any more questions? Otherwise, we'll have a coffee break now. So, friends, thank you very much. Thank you. Great work. Cheers. <laughs>